Hi M&Ms, welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. You will encounter conspiracy theories in all walks of life. Conspiracy theories can concern famous deaths and assassinations, dubious government activity or false flag terrorism. Conspiracy theories often evolve as a result of a lack of explanation for an event that has occurred. Gabby Hinsliff wrote in an article in The Guardian in 2017, quote, Like a twisted form of religion, conspiracy theories can be a coping mechanism, a means of ducking the harsh truths or imposing order on chaos. At least they provide the comfort and illusion that someone is in charge, end quote. An article written by the Daily Star in January 2015 entitled Manchester's Killer Canals details the first concerns and theories around a load of unexplained deaths. It begins by stating that in six years, 61 bodies have been pulled from Manchester's canals, some of them believed to have gone missing after nights out, but a huge proportion of them remain unidentified, with police being unable to even confirm the sex of 27 of the bodies. That's over a third of bodies that aren't just unidentified, but may never be identified unless police come up with a way to figure out their sex. Even though conspiracy theories started spreading in 2015, the unexplained deaths date back as far as 2004. David Plunkett was 21 when he visited Manchester from Halifax with his best friend Michael Vittis for a music promotion event. The event saw 3,000 people at the Daytona racetrack in Trafford Park. Alcohol was free and unlimited, which eventually saw David being chucked out of the event by bouncers for collapsing due to being too intoxicated. His friend Michael was actually a barman back in Halifax and he recalled feeling annoyed and aggressive that night, which was completely out of character for him. He was usually a happy drunk. This complete change of behaviour made him think that the drinks had actually been spiked. After being thrown out of the event, David was never seen again. His body was found two weeks later in the canal behind the Imperial War Museum. When the case went to court, a bystander recalled seeing David outside the event and noticed that he seemed aggressive and asked him for a fight. However, this is contradicted by door staff who said that David was laughing and telling them he was having a great night before shaking their hands and thanking them. David's mother Anne said it was her brother that found David's phone just upstream from where his body was found despite a police search of the area which made people think was there other things police missed whilst investigating his death? Another question that has never been answered is how did David end up at the Imperial War Museum and more so why did he end up there? As far as anyone can tell, he had no reason to go there. According to Google Maps, it's about half a mile away from where the event took place and takes roughly 10 minutes to walk. However, if David was so intoxicated that he collapsed in the event, I find it hard to believe he'd have been able to walk half a mile. There are other discrepancies in the case as well, though. Door staff say they ejected David from the event at about 12.30am, but Michael recalls being separated from him at about 11.30pm, a whole hour before he was thrown out. So where was he in that time? And why is there no CCTV footage of him being thrown out of Daytona or of him making his way to the Imperial War Museum? An autopsy performed on David once his body had been found showed that he had consumed two Southern Comforts, five glasses of wine at a minimum and approximately three quarters of a pint of beer. Michael claims, however, that David wasn't really a big drinker who never touched beer and very rarely drank wine. 
No drugs were found in David's system. However, this doesn't come as a surprise because as most people know, drugs are eliminated from the system within hours or days after they were introduced and David's body was discovered two weeks after he went missing. There weren't bound to be any drugs in his system. David's parents provide probably the most interesting evidence, however. They recall a phone call with their son just before he went missing, where they describe him as screaming and howling down the phone to them, so much so that it distressed them significantly and even made them concerned that he was being attacked. They immediately phoned 999 on another phone and put the two phones together so the operator could hear just how much distress David was in. Shortly after, though, David's phone went dead. Now, let's be real here. No matter how drunk you are, are you really going to be in that much of a state for no reason? I'll be honest, I've never been drunk, so I'm thinking as a sober person, but I'd need a reason to be so distressed that I had to call my parents screaming down the phone to them. There are so many inconsistencies in this case that no one can seem to piece together. David being reported as aggressive by some but happy by others, him drinking drinks he would never usually drink, the hour between Michael last seeing him and him being thrown out. But I have to think that these are discrepancies that may never properly be answered. In June 2009, 53-year-old Anthony Muse came to Britain from Ontario in Canada and spent seven months travelling around the country before arriving in Manchester on the 19th of January 2010. Anthony socialised in Manchester's gay village but little is known about who he socialised with or even what his final movements were. It's known that Anthony told his family and friends that he believed he had a degenerative condition. One of his friends says that he told her that when he visited Manchester in 2008, he was attacked in a bar and was convinced that it had caused him permanent brain damage. Anthony's friend Karen says that she last spoke to him on the 14th of January and he was calling to say goodbye with Anthony's family suggesting he had indicated a possible intent to self-harm. It's unsure as to what Anthony's last known movements are, but what we do know for definite is that the last confirmed sighting of him was at Manchester Piccadilly train station on the 18th of January, just over a month before his body was found in the canal near the Imperial War Museum on Wednesday the 24th of February 2010. It's unclear whether Anthony's death was an accident, suicide or murder, but what we do know for definite is that he suffered a single puncture wound to his chest. The coroner who performed the post-mortem decided that there wasn't enough evidence to suggest that this was suicide, despite Anthony sending sentimental items back to his family in the months before his death and recorded an open verdict. In December 2010, 21-year-old Nathan Tomlinson was on a Christmas party with his friends in Manchester when he went missing. A full two months went by after he was last seen leaving Mitre Bar in the city centre before his body was found in the River Irwell on the 10th of February 2011. CCTV footage was released by police which showed Nathan leaving the bar on the night he disappeared before jumping over a wall and walking across Victoria Street. He is then thought to have next been seen just under half a mile away where he's believed to be seen by a bus driver in Chapel Street before the last CCTV footage showed him walking through Salford, near to the River Irwell, where his body was later found. An open verdict was recorded into Nathan's death, with the pathologist saying it was impossible to tell whether Nathan had drowned or whether he was already deceased when he entered the water. 20-year-old Prince Alwyn was studying mechanical engineering at Manchester University. He told his friends on the evening of the 17th of February 2011 that he was going out into town for a birthday party. 
It's believed that Prince may have taken drugs on top of consuming alcohol that evening, with the bartender recalling refusing to serve Prince in the early hours of the morning, not because he was too intoxicated, but because he seemed out of it, as if he had had more than alcohol. Other people who were drinking in the bar that night also noted that Prince was acting strange, specifically around a lock in the early hours of the morning. A witness told the coroner's court that she saw Prince running that evening and she told them, quote, I was looking over the locks when I saw a face move into the light. He was looking up the street. I thought he might be hiding from the police. He ran across the lock gate and was hiding everywhere. He looked really on edge. He crouched and then jumped forward. End quote. It's believed that Prince jumped in the canal for an unknown reason, which hadn't struck the witness that evening, but she was disturbed enough to return to the scene the following day. She contacted police when the realisation hit her that Prince may have jumped into the water. His parents also grew more and more concerned when their son failed to return their calls the following day. Police immediately launched a search when they found him in the canal. A post-mortem revealed Prince had traces of alcohol and heroin in his system, which is believed to have caused him to act out of character and the coroner returned a narrative verdict, meaning that not one cause could be found as a cause of death. In June 2012, 22-year-old barman Chris Barney went to a Stone Roses gig with friends at Heaton Park. It's believed that at some point that night, after the gig had ended, Chris got separated from his friends due to the sheer busyness of it, Now, I've been to concerts before. I know how busy it can get when there are a ton of people leaving the same venue all at the same time. It's not hard to imagine how easy it is to become separated from those you've been with. But when Chris's friends couldn't find him and his parents realised that over that weekend he hadn't returned home and wasn't answering his phone, they contacted police and a huge manhunt ensued all around the region. Ten days later, on the 9th of July, Chris's body was found in the canal. CCTV showed Chris's last movements, walking through the city centre, down the side of sentry buildings and onto the walkway beside the river. A witness who lives in a flat that overlooks the walkway says he saw a man matching Chris's description sitting by the river the night he disappeared. A post-mortem revealed traces of alcohol and MDMA in his system and while the coroner was able to determine that Chris had indeed drowned, she was unable to confirm under what circumstances and again returned an open verdict. Whilst there was alcohol and MDMA in his system, the coroner suggested they may have played a contribution in his death but they didn't cause his death and this was further confirmed by the fact that Chris doesn't appear to be stumbling in any of the CCTV. The coroner also noted that Chris had cuts on his face as well as a fractured cheekbone but the lack of bruising suggested that these injuries occurred after he had died which I assume was sort of from his body bouncing off things in the canal you know I'm sure there are loads of things in the canal there are walls that he could quite easily hit his face on so that makes sense. Chris's mother says that while he did suffer with anxiety in 2010 she is adamant that he hadn't taken his own life. 18 year old Suvik Pal had moved from his home in Bangalore to study at the University of Manchester On New Year's Eve 2012, Suvik and some friends went out on the town and he was last seen at the Warehouse Project, a popular club in Manchester. Suvik was chucked out of the club some point that night because bouncers believed he had taken drugs. Some reports specify ecstasy but I can't be sure how true that is. And then was not allowed back in because they claim he was acting aggressively. 
Suvik is then reported to have walked away from the club and there's a chance that an unknown male was following him. Suvik, whose father describes him as being joyful, was never seen alive again. Police searched the local canal and came up completely empty. However, 22 days later, Suvik's body was found in exactly the same spot they had searched 22 days earlier. Suvik's father is convinced that there is third party involvement in his son's death. He just can't fathom how Suvik's body was found in a spot that had already been searched. But then, we all know water moves, obviously, and it was 22 days in between. I can see how Suvik's body may have been in one place and then had moved to where they'd already searched. So to me, that doesn't really raise any red flags. That doesn't scream third party involvement to me, but that's just me. Suvik wasn't the only person to have fallen victim to the canal on New Year's Eve 2012, however. 22-year-old Michael Simpson was at a house party with his girlfriend that night and disappeared as he was making his way home after they saw her in the new year together. The last known sighting of Michael was at 12 minutes past two in the morning when a security guard warned him of the risk of walking too close to the canal. At 2.23am, Michael texts his girlfriend, quote, at a river, no idea where to go from here, end quote. And then again at 2.24am, telling her his battery was nearly dead and saying, quote, no idea how I ended up here, end quote. It's believed that Michael ended up in the water not long after that, with his phone turning off just two minutes later at 2.26am and then his analogue watch had stopped at 2.30am. Michael's girlfriend Jennifer was already concerned about the texts he'd sent her about being near the river so she did start searching for him but the search was pointless as it was pitch black. But her concern only grew when she went to his parents the following day to find out he'd never arrived home. As it happens, Michael's father was already concerned about his son and he was already out searching for him. That evening, the family, increasingly concerned for his safety, reported Michael missing to the police. A search ensued and Michael's body was found on the 9th of January 2013, near to where he was last seen. A post-mortem was performed and the coroner returned an accidental death verdict, stating that Michael had been intoxicated and this would more than likely have contributed to his drowning. In October 2013, a couple on a narrow boat on a canal in Manchester called police to notify them that they'd witnessed a body floating in the water. Police arrived at the scene and an area was cordoned off before the canal was drained and divers went in to retrieve the body. The body was confirmed to be that of Sean Marquis, a father of three who is believed to have had an argument with his girlfriend before drinking and falling into the water. A pub landlord said that about 10.30pm, the evening before Sean's body was found, he heard a big splash and witnessed a person walking away across the bridge and it's assumed that this was the sound of Sean entering the water. A post-mortem was performed on Sean's body with the coroner returning a verdict of misadventure. On Sunday the 1st of October 2017, 22-year-old Casper Blackburn was at a friend's drinking Jack Daniels and Coke before heading out into town for the night where it's believed he was drinking vodka and whiskey. Casper left the Slug and Lettuce at 3 minutes past 2 in the morning with friends who all went back into the bar soon after but Casper failed to follow them back inside and that's the last known sighting of him. When Monday rolled around and his parents realised Casper hadn't made it home and had also failed to collect his car from a friend's, they phoned the police to report their son, who they described as intelligent, kind and gentle, as a missing person. 
A search ensued and Casper's body was found by a dog walker just under a week later on the 7th of October in the canal near the Slug and Lettuce. Casper's father stated that it was unusual for him to walk home alone and once again there are contradicting stories about how intoxicated Casper was. One witness says they saw him fall off a bar stool inside the Slug and Lettuce but a friend states that Casper seemed normal and even a detective states that whilst intoxicated Casper wasn't stumbling around. A post-mortem revealed that Casper had died as a result of drowning and police were unable to identify any third-party involvement. But was this the case? Why did he walk home in a short sleeve t-shirt in the middle of October? If he wasn't stumbling around and seemed coherent to friends, how did he end up in the water? Once again, these are questions we will probably never have answers to. Even though there are a lot of deaths that are still unexplained to this day, there are those few that genuinely were accidents. 19-year-old Charlie Pope shared a bottle of rum with his flatmate Louis Wright at their halls at Manchester University on the 28th of February 2018 before heading out to drink cocktails at a nightclub, Zombie Shack, in the city centre. The pair left in the early hours of the morning and tried to get a bus back to their halls, but the bus driver refused to let them on because he deemed Charlie too drunk. So instead, they went back to Zombie Shack. They must have got separated, however, because Louis left the venue at about 2am, assuming Charlie was either with other friends or had already gone home. And he was right. Charlie is thought to have left Zombie Shack at about 20 past 1 in the morning, and CCTV captured him walking in the direction of their halls in Fallowfield. What happened over the next three hours remains a mystery, before Charlie was caught on CCTV again at 4.43am, this time heading back in the direction of Manchester City Centre. CCTV then showed Charlie walking unsteadily in the snow, down a few streets before joining the canal towpath and moving toward a lock. Louis missed a call from Charlie at 6am, so we know he was alive then, and it's some time after this that Charlie is believed to have fallen into the canal, potentially trying to climb over one of the locks, which isn't hard to believe under the circumstances. It was the middle of the night, pitch black, he was drunk, it had been snowing, it was more than likely icy, both due to the beast from the east storm going on at the time. His body was found on the 2nd of March in water near Rainbar, exactly where he had been spotted by CCTV that night, and the coroner agreed this was an accident, with Charlie suffering for a few minutes from cold shock before going into cardiac arrest. These cases are just some of the 80 or maybe even more people that have fallen victim to the canal. Now, a massive issue with these deaths is that there are no lights along the canal towpaths, which, as I mentioned earlier, is dangerous in itself, let alone with other circumstances on top of the pitch black, such as being intoxicated or it being snowy and icy. One theory is that someone, no one knows who, hangs around the canal towpaths late at night, preying on vulnerable people and pushing them into the water. However, another theory is that there's a predator, but they're not instantly pushing them in the water. Instead, the theory suggests that this unknown person actually kidnaps the victims, tortures them for a while, and then throws them in the canal. Interestingly, these cases have been linked to a number of murders over in the US, with author William Ramsey feeling strongly about this and even suggests that the deaths are linked to the smiley face killer. William believes that people all over the world are learning how to kidnap and torture people and they're going out and putting what they've learned into practice not just in the UK, but in the US, Canada and even Australia, and then dumping bodies into rivers and canals. This theory has come about because of cases where a certain part of the canal has already been searched and then a person's body has been found in that location days or weeks later. Greater Manchester Police refuse to believe that there's a serial killer in their midst, 
let alone that the unexplained deaths are linked to deaths more than 4,000 miles away. So with all this in mind, obviously I have to include my own opinion. During my research of this case, I've had an internal monologue constantly going. At some points, I've been convinced that a serial killer exists, and other times, explanations can be found into people's deaths, and I'm back to believe in they're all accidents. But can 80 or more deaths really all be accidents? Let's go back to the fact that the majority of these people went missing whilst it was pitch black. I hate walking in the dark, so I can only imagine how difficult it must be to navigate a canal towpath that's only a couple of feet wide, in the dark, whilst under the influence of alcohol. And when I put it like that, I can see how easy it would be for a person to fall in and die quickly as a result of cold shock, or to drown because they couldn't get out of the water quick enough. This hasn't taken into consideration that a lot of these deaths happened in winter, when it was snowing and probably icy. It's completely conceivable that someone could slip on an icy path and fall into the water, drunk or not, and the water be so much colder than it is usually for them to die pretty quickly. But I have to go back to one of the first cases I told you about, the death of David Plunkett in 2004. This case has stayed with me throughout my research. How did he end up half a mile away, completely intoxicated? He was thrown out of the club because he collapsed. I can't see it being possible he could then walk half a mile without being caught on any CCTV cameras. So how did he end up there? And another question that bugs me is why did he ring his parents in such a state? As I've already mentioned, I would ring my parents if I was lost, but I wouldn't be so distraught that they couldn't understand what I was saying. Although again, I'm thinking with a sober mind and not a drunk one. Honestly, I found it so hard to come to a conclusion in this case. I have so many questions and I struggle to believe that there have been so many accidental deaths. But if there was evidence of a serial killer, wouldn't the police accept that and be determined to find them? For definite, I don't put any stock in the fact that this is linked to cases in the US or that people are being kidnapped and tortured before being found in the water. I struggle to believe that a killer doing that wouldn't have been spotted or caught already. I can believe that someone is pushing these people in, but I come back to how easy it would be to fall in a canal under the right circumstances. There are so many questions in this case that we'll probably never have answers to. We just have to hope and pray that at some point barriers will be put up along all canal towpaths across the UK to prevent another 80 deaths over the next decade. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. To view the sources and pictures for this episode, head over to www.murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com Have a great week and I'll see you all next week for another episode.